This is a really important interview about the ongoing controversy over the claims to do with the drug ivermectin and the claims about the vaccines that we've been covering on Rebel Wisdom. So there's a lot of background if you haven't been following the story. But in short, the drug ivermectin has been claimed as a powerful treatment and prevention for COVID. And the primary advocate has been the Dr. Pierre Corey and the medics of the Frontline COVID-19 Critical Care Alliance, the FLCCC. Corey gave testimony to the Senate where he called it a miracle drug, but afterwards said he regretted that language. Still, he has claimed it was highly effective as both a treatment and a prevention prophylactic against COVID, both on Brett Weinstein's podcast and also on Joe Rogan. These claims about ivermectin have become entangled with a lot of claims about harms from the vaccines, as we've also covered on Rebel Wisdom. This is an interview with Eric Osgood, who was also part of the FLCCC until very recently, and he's now said he could no longer be a part of it and felt he had to speak out. It did not occur to me that speaking in favor of a medicine that would end a potential chemo prophylactic would be so aggressively co-opted by an anti-vaccine movement. Eric says that he's not the only member of the FLCCC who feels this way. And ultimately, when it became completely abundantly clear to me beyond a doubt that nothing, that this was not going to change, I said, I, I, I can't do benefits from within anymore. I have to step away. I can't be part of this. And what do you hope happens now? Um, I hope we hear more from the individual doctors in the group. Come out and say what I know that they believe, that, that they told me when I've spoken to them, which is that they understand that this is uh, the, the ongoing harm that is taking place. So I hope you find this conversation informative and helpful to make sense of these extremely difficult and controversial topics. So Eric, welcome. Thanks. I'm speaking to you because you were part of the FLCCC, along with Pierre Corey. Obviously, he's one of the most high profile advocates for ivermectin. And one of the questions that I've had is having covered the ivermectin story and also the, the vaccine story is kind of wondering how and why the two have become so intertwined with each other. Um, there's not no obvious reason why a drug that seems to be effective, according to some evidence. We can talk about how 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 reliable that evidence is. I, I know that you are still a, a believer that it will prove to be effective. Um, but you tweeted a few days ago that you were truly sorry for any role that you served in the turn that this took. Um, I'd like to, and, and also we spoke yesterday briefly on the phone, and what I really liked about your attitude was that you similar to me, feel that a lot of this debate has been happening in a very kind of judgmental way, in a, in a way that's sort of lecturing people or assuming that people who have concerns about the vaccines are stupid. And this, that tone is really not very helpful. It's, it's kind of, um, it's not true because these are very complex arguments. And I think people are, you can understand why people would have concerns about vaccines produced at this speed in the middle of a pandemic. And I think to kind of assume that anyone who who doesn't believe that they're completely safe is is stupid is is just asking for trouble. And I know you're you're a working physician who works with this and has these conversations with patients a lot. So maybe let's start by just asking what's what's your background? What do you do day to day, and how have you interacted with this this story? Sure. Um, yeah. So you know, I'm a board certified internal medicine doctor. Uh, my primary role is what we call a hospitalist here in the States. So these, we're internal medicine doctors who work in the hospital exclusively. We don't uh, take care of patients in the office and around in the hospital. Um, I'm the medical director of a small hospitalist group. I have a great group of docs that I work with. And obviously, you know, being a, an internal medicine physician in the hospital in that role, we were pretty deep to neck deep in COVID-19 during two really bad waves. Um, and on the side, I started doing telemedicine, um, both for people who didn't feel comfortable going into doctor's offices, brick and mortar when, you know, uh, when think when this disease was under you know, no control and, and vaccines were not readily available and, uh, people would, had lost their jobs, had lost their health insurance. And a lot of what I was doing, I was either offering for free or maybe 
people could, you know, throw me five, ten dollars, whatever they could. And I would just see people for basic things, sinus infections, urinary tract infections, blood pressure medicine, refills, whatever. Um, and since then, I've been doing more um, as far as working with COVID patients as well as COVID long haulers. Uh, in addition to that, um, I work with a group called COVID Long Haulers with Dr. Bruce, uh, Bruce Patterson, Ramya Kendra. We're trying to um, uncover more about the pathology of people with post-acute sequelae of COVID-19 who just never recover and what uh, types of treatment options we might be able to offer um, based on pretty advanced laboratory analysis and going a little deeper into the, into the pathophysiology of that process and uh, trying to learn more about that condition. So that's, you know, keeping me a little bit busy. As far as uh, I would just, the only thing I would add a little bit of a correction to the idea that I'm like, I'm still a believer that this is going to work. I have no idea at this point if safe, routinely used anti helminthic meaning the doses we typically use against parasites are going to work against Delta. Um, my, my best assessment of the data that we have up to this point is that adequately timed and adequately dosed, it was showing to have antiviral effects in terms of like either accelerating the time to testing negative or reducing viral loads. It was less clear as to whether that was connected to clinical endpoints. But as far as Delta, it's a new, it's a whole new ball game. It's a much uh, more contagious virus. And I think there's probably a dose of this medicine that will have that effect, but I don't know I'm no longer confident in the number needed to treat, number needed to harm that would be associated with that dose. And the sentiment of a lot of people was always, this should only be done in the context of trials, clinical trials. My assessment was, this is a pretty safe medicine that we use for a whole range of conditions at very safe doses. I think it's reasonable to offer people kind of a risk benefit assessment and carefully monitor them. Now that I no longer see those demonstrably safe doses working as well. I'm moving more into the camp of we should be, if we're going to escalate doses now beyond what we've given to close to 4 billion people, it probably should be in the context of, context of clinical trials. So just to fill in that gap, what's been happening at the moment is there's been more breakthrough cases with regards to Delta. I mean, Pierre Corey himself got got COVID in, in the latest wave with Delta, even though he was on prophylactic ivermectin. And what you're saying is the recommendation of the FLCCC is to double the dose. And you're less, you're quite concerned about that because that's taking it into new territory and it, it's a different cost benefit analysis. Is that right? Yeah. Yeah. Great. Um, so could you maybe talk about your history with the FLCCC and then how you've got to the point that you've got to now about feeling that you had to speak out on Twitter and, and obviously this, this interview we're doing, doing now. Yeah. Um, it's, I mean, I consider every member of that group to be a friend and, um, I, you know, I'm a really you know, a big admirer of, uh, of the work that that group did coming together at the beginning of this pandemic when this was coming at us a thousand miles an hour and no one knew what to do in the medical community was deer in the headlights. Uh, we were offering patients, quote unquote, supportive care. So come into the hospital, have some oxygen, have some vitamins and some zinc and, you know, maybe some IV fluids and maybe some Tylenol and some cough medicine. And it was just kind of cross the fingers. Uh, the FDA, if you recall, at that time gave hydroxychloroquine an emergency use authorization to be given in the hospital with really no biological plausibility or evidence that it would work in that stage. Um, that was kind of the treatment du jour back then, which did not work. Um, and this is a group of physicians that was very well respected in their fields and particularly, um, with the use of, uh, of corticosteroids and lung disease and the overall assessment by the authorities of medicine was that again, particular to the use of steroids in the hospital for COVID-19 was, whoa, 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 this is viral pneumonia. And in viral pneumonia, you do not administer corticosteroids without an antiviral because you can really worsen things and it's a big no-no and contraindicated. And what a lot of the work um, that some of these doctors did early on was digging a little deeper first into the prior pandemics where the prevailing narrative was in those pandemics, people who got steroids died more. But what uh, Dr. Bertha Maduri and his colleagues did is they looked a little deeper and they said, well, 
when you're sicker, you get more of the medicines thrown at you, particularly steroids. So let's correct for severity of illness and see what the, uh, the signal shows. And when you correct for severity of illness, when you go back to MERS and SARS, for example, you find that among similarly ill people, people who got steroids died way less. And then uh, similarly, uh, early on, uh, I think it is Dr. Kane and then, uh, and then Dr. Uh, Pierre Corey put a paper out looking at um, the chest imaging that was coming out of Wuhan that indicated this was not a viral pneumonia and that this was what we call an organizing pneumonia that most doctors outside of pulmonologists don't see much in their careers, which is an inflammatory lung injury for which the gold standard treatment is steroids. And so against the re general recommendations of really all the medical authorities who said, only when someone becomes critically ill to the point that they are in what we call ARDS, when steroids become much more controversial and it was like, yeah, you can try it then. But when someone hits the hospital with COVID pneumonia, lung injury, elevated inflammatory markers, it was don't, don't give them steroids. And, the, and these doctors came out completely against the grain and not only said, hey, maybe we should, they made a protocol and started disseminating that protocol and hospitals who were using it were, were seeing benefit. And in addition, they added early use of full dose blood thinning as we call anticoagulation, which was also very controversial at the time, but it was based on very obvious bedside assessment and uh, laboratory evaluation showing that patients with COVID-19 were clotting like crazy. And you had to start that early and not wait too long because then you can actually make things worse. Both of those things have since become widely accepted and conclusively shown to reduce death in the hospital. And so the work of this group was seminal in developing what we now know to be effective protocols to save lives. And so this is just a group that I admire tremendously and still do, um, you know, for the, for the work that they did. In, and and, in and just, to, just to interject, Eric, I've, I've heard that from every doctor I've spoken to, like the amount of respect they have for before even the FLCCC. I think uh, Pierre Corey and Paul Marek and a few of the other doctors were part of another organization that was doing the same kind of thing. They were aggressively testing best practice in hospitals. They were looking at what worked. They were, they were basically challenging. They were kind of heterodox thinkers in the, in the medical establishment and being prepared to yeah, tr try anything and test best practice. And people really, really admired them for that and i think i haven't heard a single doctor who's not said that they yet yeah, that they really respected the work that they've done and as you say they they did amazing work earlier in COVID. and what happened next i mean we spoke on the phone yesterday and you said that one of the the factors was that corey and others felt they didn't get the recognition they deserved for this uh for, for being right earlier in the pandemic i don't i don't know that that necessarily bothered i think it was more that that they got really criticized and attacked at the time. And then once the evidence ultimately supported it, the narrative was just kind of like, yeah, you got lucky. And I mean, I don't, I don't know how I would psychologically react to that. I don't think I would like it. Um, and that, I mean, that was the editor in chief of the New England Journal of Medicine in a New York Times interview, I believe. He said, yeah, you know, you could just say they got lucky when in fact this was actually based on very good bedside reasoning. We don't always have double blinded trials to work with like in a rapidly emerging public health crisis. And I think our public and our patients are counting on us to be a little bit more forward thinking, not reckless, but forward thinking and not sitting back reactively and remaining inert until we wait for a large clinical trial group to hand those conclusions. And I think that's an important lesson um, so yeah, I don't think it's a matter of like, oh, bitter, we didn't get credit. I think that, you know, uh, the issue is more, we're still not seeing optimally dosed regimens in the hospital. And I agree with that. And then just to be attacked for one thing and then another, and another, and then as these things now start to be demonstrated to be beneficial going forward, it's just like, yeah, yeah, no, whatever. It just kind of becomes accepted as self-evident. And if you try to take credit for it, you just have delusions of grandeur or you're lying. And it's like, I don't think that's been fair to the group. So what happened next? We're picking up the story now, kind of moving into the sort of maybe the Senate testimony and, and, and the kind of move towards ivermectin and then, and then the kind of vaccine questions. Yeah. So the first Senate testimony was in May about steroids. 
Um, and uh, then the next Senate, so the next Senate testimony, I think, so, so before that happened, I had, I think you and I talked a little bit about how I got linked up with the group. I had done an interview. I had mentioned them because I had followed their work in the hospital. And I was interested that they had kind of started raising signals around ivermectin, which I started looking into the literature and I said, this is interesting. None of this is conclusive evidence, but there seems to be something here that needs to be looked at more, uh, more carefully. And, you know, I, they, they caught wind of this interview, reached out to me. We had great conversations and um, really the goal at the time was to get organizations like NIH and others to just look at this drug and maybe consider the evidence, arrange for, you know, government funded trials to be done and get better conclusive evidence on whether it works. And ultimately that's happened. And I, to me, that's been a, a win. Uh, but unfortunately, I think the, the, the whole kind of movement behind the medicine has become more of an ideology and has changed to like, why are we doing trials? We know for a fact that it works. And but wait a second, the, the goal was supposed to be getting the trials done. I mean, the, the principal trial in the UK is going to be is looking at it, active six by NIH, uh, you know, the, the, the together trial uh, added to one of their arms, the University of Minnesota has pulled it out. And so to me, that's good. I mean, they're, they're looking into the drug. We, you know, we have to see what the evidence shows and follow it. I think the Senate testimony, the kind of untold backstory here, I think, is that it was put together by Ron Johnson, who, I'm sorry, but he's, he's, uh, but, you know, to his credit, I guess, he has been interested in uh, treatments and drug repurposing, and he put together this panel of different doctors to come and testify before the Senate. I think it was December 5th. But if you actually look at most of those doctors, I mean, these are some pretty, I don't like using derisive language to talk about other doctors, but let's just say highly unconventional, uh, oh, sorry, <laughs> highly unconventional, uh, very questionable viewpoints on things like vaccines and uh, asymptomatic transmission and masks and whatnot, and kind of buried in that sea of like questionable doctors is here, who is this legitimate, accomplished, you know, the pioneer of point of care ultrasound and critical care, and just and he's buried in this sea of I don't know what you want to describe. And the ranking member of uh, of the minority party at the time, which was the Democrats did an opening statement where he just basically accused all the doctors of appearing that day of being politically motivated, right wing, nut jobs. And then all the Democrats got up and left. And when I saw Pierre take the microphone and testify, I could see that he was rattled and offended and uh, hurt, I think, deeply hurt. And I think that the testimony he gave and to some extent, the I guess the grandiosity of the testimony and maybe some of the language that he has since expressed that he regretted using words like miraculous and asserting, if you take this, you won't get sick. I, I think he got rattled. And I think it was not right of the minority party and the ranking member to, to talk to him that way. So this is something I've heard from quite a few other people I've spoken to who know and respect Pierre Corey and respect the work that the FLCC have done um, is that they've seen him start talking in absolutes, start behaving in a very different way to how they'd seen before. Um, maybe let's let's get into sort of that trajectory and where how you've ended up here, um, and then we'll sort of deal with some of the criticisms and some of the the, the, the questions about the 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 yeah the, the claims that have been made on both sides. Okay. Um, yeah, I mean, I consider Pierre a friend and I am an admirer of him and I will continue to be. Uh, but yeah, I, I think that what I'm seeing now is very different than the kind of conversations I had with the person that I really got to know at the beginning of all this. And from what you've said and what other positions I've talked to and beloved you know, former fellows who've trained with them, and uh, colleagues, I mean, this is just a, an absolute top-notch, excellent physician 
who has really an old school thought of medicine, or I guess comes from an old school of medicine that is really patient centered and believes in kind of critical thinking, not being robotic and, and, and using your best clinical judgment for the best outcomes for the patient, but also being evidence-based, not being hardened in your positions and refusing to accept new evidence and modify your positions. And I just think the, I don't know. Um, now it seems to be more like we're working with the a priori conclusion that this drug works and therefore any piece of evidence we see that supports that we may be a little under critical of the quality of research showing it. And then any piece of evidence that does not support that ends up getting chalked up to like pharma planted this study or, you know, this was designed to fail and that kind of thing where, you know, my position on, in, you know, if we're talking about ivermectin as a drug was always that like, this is a risk. This is a, this is a, an assessment and appraisal of that potential benefit, risk, cost, and effectiveness or lack thereof of alternatives at the time. And remember, we did not have vaccines for most people. Um, but if you're going to do that and you're going to acknowledge that, yeah, sure, a lot of practices and in infectious diseases are guided by very low certainty evidence, no clinical trials at all. Um, when better evidence starts to roll in, you then have to look at that evidence and you have to be able to modify your positions. You can't, I don't, I don't ever want this to be about my own ego and I'm perfectly willing to say I overestimated how well I think this medicine works in terms of what I'm seeing in the evidence. But at the same time, um, that I don't, that doesn't necessarily mean that one or two trials completely blows the lid off this and that this medicine has been proven useless. I don't think that's the case at all. I just think that, you you know, human health comes before any individual ego in medicine can't be ideology or belief in a medicine or how well it works can never be an ideology. Because again, our patients and the public are trusting us to use our best clinical and scientific judgment to make recommendations. Yeah, this has been my position. Like I'm ambivalent on the effectiveness of ivermectin. I think that and I've said from the beginning, I think claims like ivermectin is 100% effective as a prophylactic are incredibly reckless given the evidence base yeah. that I've seen. And it was all about two competing narratives. There was one narrative that said, it is proven beyond all reasonable doubt. Anyone saying otherwise is somehow captured, uh, is up to something. And don't trust anyone who says that we need more data. The data is in. We've got the meta studies. We've got the observational data from all these countries. It has been proven. And the only reason someone could have for saying it isn't is that they are somehow either knowingly or unknowingly captured or corrupted in some way. And the other side were saying, no, this is very shoddy data. We, we can't say with any certainty yet that this definitely works, but it's largely a safe drug. So that there's no reason not to use it, especially in developing countries. And it's clear that that was a that argument was an analogy or was was basically about it was about the suppression of what they consider to be a a proven drug. And then, well, it must be because of the vaccine manufacturers. It must be because of this. It must be because of that. And that, for me, is quite clearly now proven false. That narrative, because I mean, Gideon Myrovitz Katz, who's been looking into the data and wasn't looking into the data until quite recently in the last few weeks is now saying, well, I think a third of these papers are not only low quality, but may not have happened at all. And the, the data that's come in so far certainly seems to have a lot of fraud in it, a lot of very low quality data. So I think, I think we can say for sure now that that narrative of vast conspiracy suppressing the truth about ivermectin is not true. Would you agree yeah. with that? Yeah, and I, I really never subscribed to that, and that stuff always made me uncomfortable. Um, I mean, certainly, we don't have to be naive, and we can probably believe that, you know, the biopharmaceutical industry would prefer that they are able to come out with novel uh, trade name antivirals that they could sell without competitors, of course. I mean, you know, that's not a conspiracy theory. That's just obvious. But that is very different than the idea that there is this vast, you know, global conspiracy to suppress this drug and no one wants you to know the truth. And, you know, all they want to do is suppress anything that might work to pave the way for vaccines. I mean, that that stuff always made me very uncomfortable. 
Um, by the way, I've, I've had a lot of great conversations with Gideon. See in his writing that he's like, I would love for this medicine to work just from an epidemiological standpoint, being you know a, an expert biostatistician and what I see here, I don't see as compelling as a picture of what others see. And like, okay, that doesn't make you a bad guy. That doesn't make you my enemy. That's a useful perspective for me. Versus I have a perspective as a bed, uh, you know, a clinician at the bedside um, who's looking a little bit more into connecting both the biological plausibility of the medicine and what we've seen connecting it to when it's been used as an adjunct versus if you're an epidemiologist, you're not really interested in that. You just want to show me the data, show me the patient-centered outcomes, show me the high certainty data. Whereas I'm working with like, well, I have a patient who's under my care. At the, on the one hand, I do not want to expose them to any medicine, no matter how safe, that has no plausibility of helping them. At the same time, I do not want to fail to offer them something safe and low cost that could have prevented them from getting clinically worse and failed to offer them benefit. And that's, you know, the twin traps of therapeutic nihilism in overtreatment, as, as it's known, um, which is, is a little bit more complex of a matter. So it's, it's, very, it's, it's one thing for somebody who's in biostatistics and epidemiology to be convinced of high quality data. It's another thing for a clinician at the bedside to say, I see enough of sort of a risk benefit profile here where I can kind of cautiously offer this to my patients or make it kind of an adjunct treatment where I think it's having an effect size, it's very different than this is a miracle cure that they're trying to hide from you. And if you're against it, you're working for Bill Gates or whatever else. And that's why I've been able to get along with a lot of the prominent doctors on uh, on, on like social media who are either very skeptical of, of ivermectin. The, the ones that I've kind of not got along with are the ones that will say, well, if you're even thinking that it works or using it, you're just some kind of crazy quack and you're pushing snake oil. Like, I don't think that's how physicians should be speaking to each other. And um, I just don't think that's in keeping with the reality of evidence-based medicine, which is that, especially in infectious diseases, many of our practices are based on nothing even close to conclusive evidence. And we just sometimes have to work with the best evidence we have. So if you're one of those doctors, yeah, I'm probably going to have a pretty contentious back and forth with you. But if you're somebody who just says, look, I'm looking at this data. I, I, it'd be great if it worked, it's safe, it's low cost. I just don't see what you guys see. I'm not convinced. That's fine. That's, we, all, we all can have different opinions. We can all have uh, different appraisals of, of, of medicines and data. But, you know, that's not how everybody feels. Yeah, it, it sounds like you're getting um, attacked from all sides by trying to hold a nuanced position in the center, uh, which is um, kind of interesting. And yeah, I'm a farmer chill. I work for Bill Gates. I'm paid by pharma. And I'm going to be, you know, I get a lot of references to Nuremberg and other things for because I'm convincing people to get the vaccine. I'm going to be put on trial for crimes against humanity. And then on the other side, you know, I'm a, I'm a snake oil salesman in a ivermectin huckster pusher pushing quackery and snake oil when it's i mean i don't think i'm either one of those things but i guess people can say whatever they want mm. yeah and maybe let's move on to the question of the vaccines because i mean i i'd like to ask you why you feel um so yeah i think i think we spoke before and you said that you were having kind of sleepless nights a little bit about your your role in what's been unfolding. So maybe maybe let's start there. Yeah, I mean, I guess I don't, I've never really had a lot of experience with the anti-vax community versus people who have been speaking out for a long time or a little bit more experienced and savvy with kind of how they operate and how they kind of uh, infiltrate their way into different messages and utilize it. And so I, it did not occur to me that speaking in favor of a medicine that would have potential chemo prophylactic would be so aggressively co-opted by an anti-vaccine movement. And so I'll, you know, I'll post something, hey, this is interesting. This is a high quality trial that showed that a combination of ivermectin, one dose and five days of doxycycline, you know, reduced disease progression or, you know, this is an interesting case control study that showed that healthcare workers who took ivermectin didn't get sick with COVID as much as those who didn't. There are major weaknesses to that trial, but it's interesting. And then someone would retweet it and say, you know, hashtag stop the shot or like end the vax. And I'm just like, when I started seeing stuff like that, I started realizing that there's a whole other nature, a whole other side of this beast. 
And as I started seeing more and more people with those extreme views gravitating toward me and following me, and it just became very clearly obvious that there was a gigantic overlap between people who were, you know, uh, zealous about this medicine. And I guess maybe for them, I served the role as like a more credible voice and somebody being more nuanced, but that I would help the movement or something. I don't know what they saw in me, honestly, because I never came out and said I had high certainty or proof that this worked. But um, if, if my influence and my tweet, I mean, you know, I think it's like 5,000 followers, I'm, I'm nobody, but if anything I did contributed in any way to somebody getting the messaging that it is okay for me to turn down a vaccine in favor of the chemo prophylaxis, even though I never said that, or to in turn maybe use something that I said in order to influence someone else, that's what keeps me up at night. Because I, I mean, I don't, I didn't do that. I never, you can follow back to the things I was saying publicly about the vaccine when a lot of people had doubts about it before they were even out. And I was speaking favorably about them. I never made my, you know, I never minced my words about how in favor I was about the importance of vaccinating the globe. But like, if anything I did or said, like, I think it's clear you're doing your best and you're you care deeply about people and that's if why my, you are if my influence in any way provoked people to like decide against making that important decision to get themselves immunized like I have to live with that even though I didn't do it on purpose mm. Yeah, I think your passion for your patients is really clear in, in everything you're saying, Eric. I mean, it's coming through very clearly for me. Um, I, I, would, I would say this is my sort of next question, and I'd love to, in a moment, talk to you about like, what the arguments are that you have seen and why, why you don't feel that those make much sense, some of the anti-vaccine arguments. I've spent a bit of time looking into those. I've said before, I'm, I'm ambivalent about ivermectin, but a lot of the anti-vaccine arguments that have been made by people like Steve Kirsch, that uh, my friend Brett Weinstein has hosted on his podcast, as I've looked into them, have clearly been false. And misrepresentations of data, um, either deliberately or accidentally, and many of them have not stood up in any way to any kind of critical scrutiny. And what has been, what I can't understand is why someone who clearly has an ethical core like Pierre Corey has ended up in a relationship with someone like Steve, Cor Steve Kirsch um, and some of the other people making the anti-vaccine arguments there's no obvious overlap between the two. There's obviously a Venn diagram in terms of where people who are skeptical of the mainstream are also pro-ivermectin and also anti-vaccine, but it does seem very bizarre. And my, my strong feeling, and I'm saying this in a film that's being released at the same time as this one, I feel like Corey and others, um, their association with Steve Kirsch and people like him discredits them in a major way. I, I struggle to take anyone seriously if they don't call out the bullshit on their own side. And it's a difficult thing to do in this highly politicized environment, as you've experienced, to hold that very nuanced perspective and to say what you believe to be true, even though it leads some people to, to attack you in public. Um, so I want to sort of, yeah, to, to, to yeah. ask... How do you think we've got to this point? You know, I mean, with, with respect to Steve, I mean, like, if he, he can have his opinions about the vaccine, if he had kept them to himself, he would be doing a gigantic end zone dance right now around phlevoxamine. Because he was on top of that SSRI phlevoxamine thing. I mean, it was really the work of Dr. Lenz and Dr. Rearson and colleagues who, who got the science and the work done. But I mean, he really heavily invested in the trials he really worked very hard to promote 
um, the aggressive study and implementation of fluvoxamine, which um, did turn out in the TOGETHER trial to actually reduce hospitalization in other patients with COVID-19. But that, unfortunately, when you put that into the sea of all the anti-vaccine stuff, there, there, it's just the harm associated with any one person that you convince not to get a vaccine versus the benefit of maybe pushing this treatment, it's not even close, unfortunately. And those talking points about really it's just these are kind of academic exercises about what if the spike protein is really doing this? And what about, you know, the possibility of antibody dependent enhancement for which we haven't seen evidence? We've seen evidence to the contrary. Or, you know, what about this VAERS database? And like if you if physicians want to have those conversations with each other privately um, in a manner that is just purely academic, thought experiment based, that's fine. I don't think medical topics should be taboo necessarily. But when you have a podcast and millions of listeners and you, along with like you know, Malone and whatnot, are speaking publicly and scaring the crap out of people about getting this thing, when people already have a very understandable, very natural aversiveness or fear about getting a medical intervention that is new. I mean, mRNA vaccines are new. We've been studying them and researching them in animal and humans for a long time. But in terms of like mass deployment during a pandemic, it's never been done. And people have natural reservations, uh, unanswered questions, um, sort of unmitigated fears. And if you're feeding them a bunch of unsubstantiated crap, you are contributing them. You're you are contributing to them making the decision. I'm not getting this thing. And of course, if they're not going to want to get the vaccine, they want to protect themselves somehow. They you know a lot of them take the pandemic very seriously. Oh, there's this medicine, and I think that is the overlap, right? I don't think it's that necessarily because you you know uh, think that there's value in a chemo prophylaxis medicine that you are inherently anti-vaccine or anything like that. I just think that is the natural progression of. I'm scared of this new thing. Here's this old thing that's been around for a long time. You're scaring me of some of these things you're saying about this new thing. I want this thing instead, even though this thing has very low certain scientific certainty behind it versus you have this other thing that is called a vaccine that has very high certainty evidence of extremely effective protectiveness against hospitalization and death. And so when patients come to me in telemedicine saying, I want to forgo this to that, I have to explain to them what a crazy risk benefit assessment that is. And any public health communicator or physician who is telling people that it is a good idea or reasonable to forgo a vaccine in order to take a medical chemo prophylaxis, it's giving you terrible medical advice. And I've seen how challenging it is to deprogram people who have been listening to this kind of stuff from it. Can, can you explain, so one of the things I've seen happen, so Sam Harris, for example, had a podcast with Eric Topol, and one of the, re he got a lot of backlash for that podcast, and I think one of the reasons was that they generally relied on a kind of medical authority model that I think a lot of the people who are skeptical of the vaccines or are pro ivermectin don't don't really respect like they they've seen how the authorities have got things wrong they rightly are concerned that the medical authorities could be getting things very wrong here the the health authorities could be getting things very wrong here and i think those arguments start getting mixed up with the purely sort of medical and scientific arguments about well how how likely is are for example steve kirsch's or robert malone's claims to be true based on what we know so I wonder if you could, um, I know you've had these conversations a lot with your patients, so I wonder if you could outline, like, what are the specific claims that come up a lot? And what is your view on the medical evidence or truth behind those? Yeah, so I mean, the common one is the spike protein is a toxin, and the mRNA vaccines are going to make your body make a toxin, and it's going to get into your reproductive system and your heart, and it's going to make you sick. and that's one. Another one is, well, it's going to cause antibody dependent enhancement. And when they wear off, we're going to get even sicker and we're going to have to keep getting booster shots every four months. And they're just trying to generate profits or, um, you know, 
look at all these deaths in the bears database. That's really probably the biggest one. And I think the way that the bears is being communicated has been unsound. I think when you try to kind of debunk a lot of these fears, because people tend to rely on the fact that, well, anybody can just go in that system and just make anything up. And to me, I'm like, I'm sure that happens, but no, that's not the thing about the bears database is not that it's a bunch of made up claims. And in fact, when you go on that site, it will tell you, you could be, prosecuted for doing that I'm, i have no doubt some people do it the problem is when you are unleashing or, or, or you know utilizing any sort of mass public health strategy intervention it could be a saline shot it could be a placebo it doesn't matter if you tell people hey we're gi we're giving this vaccine it's, it's mrna and you start administering it to hundreds of millions of people under this microscope and people are all waiting and kind of anxious you're going to see more reports than you will during traditional vaccine campaigns because during a usual flu season vaccine a rollout, no one's thinking of that. Versus right now, everyone's got a microscope. And so you're going to see more reports. Furthermore, there are conditions that have annual incidences of X per 100,000 per year. So when you are watching very closely something get rolled out to 190 million people, you're going to see a lot of these events. And it does not mean that every single VAERS you can tally up and say, these are how many deaths these vaccines cause, is that there are actually epidemiological techniques you'd have to apply to make causal inferences. And when you actually do that, you find that the likelihood of you dying or becoming debilitatingly ill or having some horrific consequence from the vaccines is unbelievably, exceedingly minuscule small. But you can make it and sound... Yeah, and what about the the other things you mentioned, the spike protein, and um, what was the other the other one you mentioned? The well, they, well, yeah, the spike protein. I mean, there's very preliminary research where it appears that you know pieces of the spike protein, um, uh, you know, among people who have gotten a vaccine, um, are 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 being isolated, but we have no idea if this is attached to any clinical meaningfulness. We don't know if maybe these are people who got infected much earlier, but now their nucleocapsid test is negative because maybe it's just been that amount of time and maybe that's why the spike protein ended up in their monocytes or whatever it is. Like you have to be very careful with basic science. And if you're gonna kind of extrapolate and think, well, what could this mean clinically? That's fine, but you can't communicate major public health decisions based on that because you, you don't know what these things mean. And so when people talk about the spike protein, like if the spike protein were a toxin, We've given this thing literally to billions of people. I think 190 plus million in the U.S. have gotten at least one shot. If this were a toxin, it would be very clear that this were a toxin. That just does not hold up to very basic empiric observation. Mm -hmm. um, and then in terms of antibody-dependent enhancement, if that were happening, what we would be seeing is that people who were vaccinated would be getting the sickest, more severely ill than those who were coming in who had not been vaccinated and what we see is the exact opposite of that overwhelmingly the people getting the sickest are the people who are not immune either they have not been exposed and infected or they have not been vaccinated so that is literally i mean you can well, maybe theoretically ade could happen but we've seen no evidence of it and all evidence of it is to the exact contrary you're taking something that happened with a very different virus dengue and applying something that there's no evidence of as a reason not to uh, get a very demonstrably life-saving intervention. It's just not a good risk-benefit strategy. And the other thing I tell people, because they'll, then they'll say, well, it's not even you know protecting against transmission anymore, and it was. It's like, yes, it. That, I mean, there's merit to that. But what I'll tell people is, look, you know, I'm like, I practice in the state of New Jersey. We have very high zero uh, positivity or very strong seroprevalence between the people who are infected and the very effective vaccine rollouts we did here. They'll say, yeah, so you're in the crosshairs. Everybody else can breathe this thing at you and you are not protected. I'm, uh, I'll, I'll just look the person in the eye or through the camera and I'll say, I'm really worried about you. Like, you know, you come, you're my patient, I'm seeing you, I'm having this clinical encounter with you. If I know you're out there not vaccinated, I'm gonna be worried about you because you are gonna get this thing and even if you don't have in the hospital, I have this I have this long haul practice. I've seen what this does to people. 
and I'm genuinely worried about you. And just please, will you just go get the shot? Like, and you would be surprised how if you demonstrate to people that you care and you're not wagging your finger at them, you're not in, implying that they're stupid, um, but just genuinely showing empathy and concern, how well that works. Yeah. And I mean, one of the things that I have found, so I did a, a film on the channel called Ivermectin For and Against, uh, because what I was concerned about was that you had these two narratives that just were not, we've got these, these echo chambers, these filter bubbles. So there's kind of what is considered obviously true in one is considered obviously false in another. And I was seeing this kind of playing out with the Ivermectin story. And I thought, okay, I'll do a story that shows so I had Tess Laurie on, and I also had Gideon and Graham Walker, who's an, an MD from San Francisco, who were making the counter argument. So Tess Laurie was obviously one of the principal ivermectin advocates, and they were making the counter argument. I put them both in the same film, and I thought, well, let's just host this one film so at least people can see the arguments and the counter arguments and can make up their minds for themselves. Um, uh, uh, incidentally, YouTube took that down. I, I think it was a an algorithm that took it down and they put it back up when I, when I appealed. Um, and I was thinking about potentially doing a similar thing with the vaccine because I, I think we're in a world now where we can't, what used to happen is that the, the legacy media or the mainstream media was able to sort of gatekeep certain perspectives out of the media. So anti-vaccine claims would not get a lot of prominence. Um, although there's a fascinating backstory that Andrew Wakefield in the UK, who then his claims about the MMR vaccine did get hugely boosted by the media in the UK. in I think 1988 or 98, sorry, it was a, an article in Nature magazine uh, that was then picked up by the entire media, which is why, like I'm a journalist, I worked in a newsroom in the UK for like 20 years. The Andrew Wakefield story is a story that every single journalist knows because it shows what can go wrong with medical reporting. He had this article, this, this study based on 12 children in nature that was then picked up by the, by the entire media. And for months, there were stories about the MMR vaccine and autism. And the, the uptake of the vaccine in the UK went sort of to 80% from something like 95%. And it was then, it was actually an investigative journalist who dug into the story and found that not only was that study fraudulent in many, many ways, but he was paid by a lawyer operating for the children. I'm sure you know the, the, the backstory of this, but, I'm, but I think that so many people don't because they're not aware of, like, I don't think people realize how sophisticated the anti-vaccine crowd were before the pandemic. Like it existed, there was, a, there was already a very strong ecosystem that via social media and under pressure of the pandemic has now become extremely kind of has metastasized and spread into many different areas and is affecting people who were never concerned about vaccines before. But this was the, these are people who are very well equipped and very well honed at making their, their arguments. Yeah. And yeah, I, I, and I, I guess you've had more interactions now with some of the, the anti-vaccine skeptics. And I think it's also very clear, like all the way through, I've been trying to kind of pull these apart. Okay. You've got, people who are rightfully skeptical of these new technologies. And then you have the anti-vaccine hardcore that are unreachable, that are relentless, that are obsessive. And so many medical figures I know have had interactions with these, these people. And it's not, it's never a very pretty sight. No. And I mean, interestingly, a lot of the people I talk to who are, you know, you know, I'll never get J&J, I'll never get AstraZeneca, I'll never get Pfizer, I'll never get Moderna. They've like got their arms Leaves rolled up waiting for a Novavax. Like, I want that one. It's hard to call that an anti-vaxxer. I don't know what you call that. I mean, that's... I don't think that one's coming for a while, though. Um, Is that the yeah. Russian one? No, that's the one that's... Um, no, it's not the Russian one. I don't, I'm not gonna, I don't know which country it originates from, but it's basically a, uh, it's a nanoparticle based. So it's, it's a different type of technology. And from all indications, it's an excellent vaccine. And has it got the Bill Gates? Has it got the Bill Gates nanobots in it? <laughs> but it, you know, apparently fewer side effects were seen in the trials. And I, 
and um, apparently highly effective. And so I don't, I don't know. I think the word anti-vaccine gets thrown around a little bit sloppily and it does not adequately um, describe a lot of people who have their MMRs and they have their annual flu shots and everything else. They just don't want this thing. So it's like anti-vax gets thrown around. And I think to an extent it's meant to humiliate people who uh, mm. don't want to yeah. speak publicly about, you know, I think this whole thing should be a learning opportunity for a lot of people in communication in the mainstream that you cannot, I mean, it's, it's kind of obvious if you, if you understand anything about human psychology, you cannot shame people into, into thinking a certain way or into behaving a certain way. And it's entirely counterproductive if you try and do that. And that's, I, I'm surprised that it that it's not that obvious to people, but it does seem to be. Like, I think a lot of people are, are, are defaulting maybe back to their kind of, um, yeah, it's kind of frustrations and um, inabilities to kind of reason because of the the feeling of sort of intensity around these these messages and sort of the the the, the life and death nature of some of these conversations. I think is sending a lot of people into. Um, where they're acting in ways that are probably not beneficial for their own interests. No, I agree. We talked yesterday and, you know, when I, I talked about how like the natural reaction to being told that you're either stupid or something's wrong with you or being spoken to derisively is not to say, oh, you know what? You're right. It's, it is to seek validation. And so if you want validation, what are you going to do? Well, I'm going to go to somebody that sounds smart or has an MD or a PhD after their name who's telling me I'm right to be concerned and scared. And so you're driving people into the arms of those who want to scare them about vaccines instead of taking a, an opportunity to effectively communicate, right? So it's completely counterproductive. And what would you say is the single or some of the most convincing arguments for the vaccines that you're aware of? I mean, I saw you you tweeted something that you're asking if 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 anyone could reference any long term damage caused by vaccines it, would would you say that that's that's one of them that vaccines are not known to create long term damage yeah i think it, it it depends on the person the argument has to be tailored different people have different concerns ultimately it sometimes comes down to look you know in a perfect world i'd love to be able to sit back and wait and let more data accumulate before I tell you to go get this thing. But honestly, you're in the line of fire. You're going to, you know, I've had people who are in their 70s. Like, do you understand the risk that you're at right now? Please just go get this thing. And the other thing I found to be effective is that it's really the biggest psychological hurdle is the first shot, if, it's, if we're talking about the mRNA vaccines, versus really the predominance of side effects come after the second one with the exception of people who have been previously infected. So to, to, to non-prior exposed people. So if you can just, look, just go get the first shot. It's fine. You're going to have a little sore arm. I promise you, like, nothing's going to happen. Um, once you can break that barrier and the person just kind of goes and does it, and then they send you that email, that text, I did it, doc, you know, um, even though they know that that second one's probably going to have more side effects, it's easier to get it. Because it's like you already you already went into the shallow end of the pool and now you're kind of in, you know. And so I think another effective strategy is just like, come on, just go get just go schedule your shot. Um, and then as far as like, you know, the whole dichotomy between either you're a lunatic who's taking horse pace or you go get vaccinated. Well, I don't want to see anybody use veterinary products. And I would if you and I told you, if you really think that ivermectin is going to protect you against COVID and, and, you know, maybe it has, you know, a beneficial effect against the virus to some degree. But if you believe that it protects you against the virus, you would have to believe that it would protect you against the vaccine, right? Because spike protein, same thing. I'll say, why don't we do this? Like, I'll call, I'll give you some ivermectin, but when you go pick it up, I want you to get your first shot. And then over the next six weeks, you're going to build antibodies up. You're not going to be immune yet. You can take this once a week to offer you some protection in the meantime. So now that's one less person that's ingesting a veterinary product. They're under medical supervision instead of doing it in a self-directed manner. 
and now they got their vaccine. And just a couple of uh, questions before we we finish. I mean, one of the one of the points, one of the things that I was feeling from very early on while I was kind of researching this and looking into the the story was this sense that this was actually quite a small ecosystem of people. Uh, Robert Malone, Steve Kirsch, uh, Brett Weinstein, uh, Pierre Corey, Tess Laurie, the names that many people will be familiar with. And my sense was that they were generally just talking to each other because they were saying things that I didn't think you could say if you were having kind of a lot of back and forth with, with medical figures outside their little bubble. Like I was told by more than one of them that the vaccines hadn't gone through animal trials, which you, you can't really... Like that's so wrong that it's difficult to imagine how you could say that, how you could believe that and repeat that um, without, like you, it just shows you, you can only be speaking, you, 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 can, you can't be speaking to people who with any kind of level of medical expertise or common sense about, like if you're repeating that kind of thing, like in a way it, it shows how small your bubble must be. And the irony is that in the aftermath of the film that I made, where I talked about Steve Kirsch, I talked about Rob Malone and Pierre Corey and all of these people. Steve Kirsch then sent me an email with obviously a complaint, but he copied in all of the people who'd been on the film and basically demonstrated to me exactly what I had suggested, that it was a very small ecosystem of people who all knew each other and all basically kind of united around a shared narrative behind the scenes. Um, which is kind of ironic, and I, I feel very comfortable saying that because that was not off the record. It was not a. It was not my approach. Steve Kirsch approached me, um, but I think proved my point that I made in in the film. And my sense is that this is a very small group of people who are putting out this kind of yeah, th this these claims that are shown not to be true. Yeah, I mean, it seems to be. I don't, you know, I can't really think of. Of anybody else and so ultimately um and that's the thing i guess that's what i was moving towards um it's hard to it's hard to it's hard to communicate that to people i think like how how solid how small a group of people this is and how much of a medical consensus there is on the other side and it's not and when people hear that i think people who are minded to think a bit more conspiratorially or that the mainstream might have got things so drastically wrong. And I'm not saying that they, that they can't. I mean, there are issues where that can happen, but at the same time, I don't think people recognize like how much of a medical consensus there is. And these are not all people who are, this includes all the doctors I speak to who are incredibly skeptical of big pharma, who are incredibly skeptical of, the incentive structures of the way that medicines, medical trials can be warped, all of this kind of the information that Brett, for example, has put out multiple times. He sort of said, don't you understand? This is how institutional capture works. And you read from Ben Goldacre's bad science and bad pharma. And it's like, this is like, yes, but every single doctor I know knows that. They, they're aware of that. Most doctors I know are very suspicious of the pharma industry. They're very suspicious of how these medical trials can be manipulated and are skeptical about drugs until they get better data. And like this is, yeah, it, it's difficult to, to, to communicate that to people, I think, as just how unlikely and isolated these people are and these claims are. Um, and, and my experience in, in journalism is what they are saying is, is impossible. It's simply impossible that so many people are in on it and so many people are not saying what they believe to be true or are somehow corrupted ethically. Uh, and, and that's sort of where I come down to. Like, it's difficult to communicate that because it's still my word and my observations that I'm just trying to get across. Yeah, no, I mean, it doesn't it doesn't really hold up. And the, the, one of the more common things I hear and see all over the place is, they can't let this work. Otherwise, the vaccine emergency use authorizations go away because you can only have an EUA if there's no other. Like, show me where on the FDA website it says that if a medicine gets like a grade 2C recommendation from, you know, whoever it is, IDSA or whatever, that that makes EUAs go away. That's, like, that's not a thing. And, you know, again, with the TOGETHER trial. Yeah, I mean, that, that EUA argument that I've heard Brett Weinstein make is, 
is, is obviously ludicrous. I mean, in, in a pandemic, the idea that, oh, well, if ivermectin was proven to be 100% effective, that would mean the emergency youth authorizations were then ineffective. Therefore, that is the qui bono that means that's why the, the research is being harmed. That's why the big pharma vaccine manufacturers are all in it together, blah, blah, blah. Like, that's, that's crazy thinking. That's, it's, it just doesn't make sense on the face of it because, of course, in a pandemic, every medical authority would want any weapon they can. Yeah. And, and, and there are also arguments, like, there, there are strong arguments all around the world for saving money and using ivermectin. It's not simply the case that the financial drivers point in only one direction. Yeah. And then, I mean, in the, but again, the other extreme of that is like, if you don't have gold standard evidence for something, you're a quack if you even think it might work or that it's reasonable to try it. And like, there were, in, in 2019, there was a New England Journal of Medicine perspective article. Uh, what they'll do is they'll highlight journal articles from other journals and say, and, and some of them are just more like for perspective. And then there's some that they will entitle practice changing. And the New Journal of Medicine did a practice changing article uh, on the use of ivermectin to prevent malaria via a putative insecticidal anti-mosquito mechanism. And they looked at a small observational study in Burkina Faso where they distributed to little children under five and they found observationally that malaria burden was reduced or malaria disease severity was reduced. And the conclusion was yeah, this is a small observational study, but this is a safe, low-cost intervention, and hey, maybe go for it. And then like a year goes by, and it's like, well, no, unless you have, in a pandemic, clear gold standard, 100% evidence, it's quacker to even suggest that you might do something to try, even if it's safe, low-cost. So I just don't like the extremes. I think you can acknowledge that we might be wrong, and we might be overestimating the effect, but you can make an overall analysis based on cost, risk, burdens, effectiveness of alternatives, et cetera, feasibility, and but if you do that, you then have to be open to new evidence not supporting your claims and you have to modify your positions and not be a zealot and say anything that does not support what I think is big pharma trashing this drug, which, of course, would not explain why they found fluvoxamine to be beneficial, which is another old, safe, generic medicine. So just it, the, the arguments kind of collapse. And just. Finally, what do you feel is going on at the moment? Or what do you believe is going on at the moment with the FLCCC? It, it does seem that they're, they're under more pressure uh, because of their kind of increased anti-vaccine stance. What's your sense of what's going on with that? I don't, I mean, I don't think they're putting out an anti-vaccine stance. I just think that they are really being very careful in terms of not coming out with a full throated support of getting vaccinated. And just kind of like, it's a personal decision for everybody. We're not going to tell you what to do one way or another. Talk to your own doctor, which I just think that unfortunately, the reality is the way that gets perceived is like, wink, wink, take, you know, take ivermectin. Um, even though I don't think that's, I genuinely do not think that's the intention. Um, I don't know. I think a lot of the, a lot of the, a lot of the supporters, are not really thrilled about vaccines. And so I think if you're going to have a page dedicated to here are the measures that are going to prevent you from getting ill based on the evidence, well, it would naturally have to have vaccines at the very top of that because that is the intervention with the best evidence for reducing the likelihood hugely of ending up with a severe COVID-19 outcome. And so a lot of you know, medical professionals online are highlighting the fact that, well, it's not there. And um, I just, so it got to the point where I just kind of had to speak up and say, look, that can't be the position of a group that I'm going to be a part of. And if, if, if the position isn't going to change and the group is not going to really emphatically in terms of prevention strategy, say, yeah, vaccines first and foremost, and then sure, there's low middle income com in, uh, income countries that only have 2% vaccines and, you know, country, you know, Cambodia here, or this country there. And we're trying to work with governments over there to give ivermectin distribution to try and study it and see if we can reduce harm. But in countries that have vaccines, go get your vaccine and let's work on that global inequity and start getting more vaccines to the countries that don't have them. Like, but that's not the stance. I just can't do it. And what I would say is that 
I, I can't, I don't know if I can say most, but the doctors in the group that I've spoken to agreed with me and thanked me and, and felt the same way and said, yeah, I can't really do this anymore either. This is crazy. Um, in many cases, they were involved very heavily with the early stuff with the steroids and all that and really haven't been doing much as far as the whole outpatient protocol and, you know, ivermectin and all that stuff. And they, they you know, they've, they've been having the same concerns as I have been because I'm the one that kind of spoke up and that happened accidentally. I really was communicating with a couple of people within the group just to test the waters and see if I was alone. And then it ended up getting shared group wide and that just kind of, you know, provoked it. But I don't, I, I just, I, I don't want to put the idea out there that I'm like against anybody or that I'm like the, everybody every doctor in that group is my friend and um i think that they've contributed immensely to the uh the treatment of this and i just don't think that the doctors in the group is if you've been following me on twitter i expressed that the the sort of editorial decision making of what the media page for the group does is not indicative of the way that like the doctors in the group at large feel and I just think like the me like it, it, there was no media team when the group came together. It was just a group of doctors, and I think that when you get media people involved, the the, the project becomes like get the word out. You got to get the word out, right? We got to raise awareness. We got to get the message out. But unfortunately, the message has become kind of a mess, and now it, the only people talking about ivermectin are like, look, what are you eating the tube of horse paste? Like it's it's not the kind of attention that you want, and. I started seeing this coming and this was my, this was my concern. And ultimately when it became completely abundantly clear to me beyond a doubt that nothing, that this was not going to change. I said, I, I, I can't do benefit from within anymore. I have to step away. I can't be part of this. And what do you hope happens now? Um, I hope we hear more from the individual doctors in the group come out and say what I know that they believe that, that they told me when I've spoken to them, which is that they understand that this is uh, the, the ongoing harm that is taking place. And the majority of the people being hospitalized are hospitalized because they are not immune to this disease and that they need to get vaccinated. And that the whole ivermectin thing is sort of a very interesting, you know, uh, as far as being a potential adjunct treatment and offers benefit and there's mechanisms of action by which we do think it has benefit and that, it, we don't think that it should be kind of, uh, you know, rhetorically thrown in the trash, but like it does not belong in a conversation of like, oh, get vaccinated or do this. And that not only does it not belong there, like it's nuts to even think that. I, I hope that we begin to hear more emphatically from doctors, like my colleagues who I know believe that too. Um, what I also hope happens is that in, in, in more of a broader scale is that the the frustration and rage that we are seeing from people on the front lines and in media about, you know, the, the relatively small percentage of anti-vaccine people in highly vaccinated high income countries. I would like to see that anger and attention turned into the machine that is preventing these things from being equitably and justly allocated globally. Cause that's where the, that's where the variants are coming from. Right. If we were doing a better job of getting the rest of the world vaccinated, we wouldn't. We, these things were efficacious enough that even if we did have 10, 20 percent of the population who weren't going to roll their sleeves up, we would have been OK. I think variants are being driven by all the regions of the globe. We're not vaccinated. Now we're going to start doing boosters in high income countries and we're going to leave, you know, 20 percent of the world's population to continue to be in harm's way. And to continue to see variants flying around, we're not going to be able to end this thing. So from a broader media standpoint, I wish, and I did see finally CNN is starting to speak up about it. And we're seeing more like the WHO has come out against booster shots in high income countries. And we need to do more for global equity of vaccines. Like that's what I want to see happen. I also want to see what happens with the 2030 incoming ivermectin clinical trials that have been going on for the last year. And whether or not we start to see some different results than sort of the big three trials that all came out of South American countries with a lot of background self-directed ivermectin use, where I don't know if we had clean placebo groups in those. 
trials, to be honest with you. Um, you know, and there's trials coming out of European countries and other countries where there was not a lot of self-directed ivermectin use. And we may see effect sizes that we did not see in the, in the other trials. And again, those trialists did a good job. They ran good clinical trials. They don't deserve to be accused of being pharma plants or anything like that. They did good work. In all three cases, there were quantitative but non-statistically significant lower rates of either deterioration or hospitalization among the ivermectin group compared to the placebo that didn't reach statistical significance. I just don't think we can conclude from that that it doesn't work. We, we can't conclude from those trials that it does, but I don't yet think we can conclude that it doesn't work. And I think we need to see what some of these additional trials show us and, uh, and, and go from there. So I, I want to see what the ultimate research shows. There's a number of other safe low-cost interventions that seem to have some benefit in like phase two. I want to see those things come to light. So I want, in addition to vaccines, I want as quickly as possible to get effective treatments allocated. So really to just do, you know, reduce as much harm as we can. And I don't know, I guess get more on the same page, on the same side. Like it's, uh, it's us against this virus, not us against us. And uh, I, I just wish we uh, would be able to find a way to reduce some of the tribalism and, and kind of all get on the same team. Yeah, that's a really great note to end on, Eric. Thank you so much for making the time and really appreciate your perspective on this. All right. Oh, pleasure. Thank you.